Hola from Chaminger. My name is Fabian Chagoya, and I'm your host of Social Wisdom. How do you know what to work on to improve? By being exposed to what is actually possible or obtainable. A major goldmine of untapped knowledge and experience is learning from others. Social Wisdom. Be a sponge. Save yourself countless lessons and years of figuring it out the hard way by absorbing it firsthand from others. And here we go. Hey guys, today on Social Wisdom, we discuss getting comfortable with the uncomfortable with Michael Dudley. So how are we doing, Michael? I'm doing fantastic, man. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for reaching out, agreeing to do this. I think there is this almost like fear that a lot of people have getting interviewed, sharing their advice, sharing their story. There's like this feeling that, well, I almost got lucky, or I don't know if I want everyone to know the crazy things that I did, yet here you are. And I think there's a lot of kudos and respect that I have to give to that. I appreciate that, man. I'm going to let you down before I, I pick you back up. I, I don't have all the answers. As I mentioned, uh, I probably know the wrong way to do things more than the right way. But I think that's the the big piece that um, I, I feel like I can, if I can encourage anybody, it's just you know, keep trying, keep trying to, to listen to people that are, are two steps ahead of you, because you could probably learn something um, from their mistakes. And, and uh, maybe if you make one less mistake, that's, that's fine. At the end of the day, you're, you're not in a ne necessarily one straight path. It's a wiggle. You'll get there. I love that. Yes, you guys will always get there eventually and keep listening and it'll definitely help you. I want to go into our small talk segment first before we really get started into discussing your story and your advice and your lessons and go from there. So how have you been with everything that's happened really over the last, I would say, year and a half? So much has changed. I know I have taken significant risks. My life has changed dramatically. I mean, I used to be much more extroverted and socializing, and now I've been very uh, holed up, but by choice and gladly, and I've realized a lot of benefits. So I'm curious, what has kind of changed for you over the last year and a half? Yeah, man. Well, I would say, you know, anything that I had... Um, set as a as a normal was flipped upside down and and i think back as an individual contributor as a healthcare software company i did very well i moved into management and then i i loved being in that management role because i could be, kind of be drop shipped into deals i had to know like very little and i could just basically be kind of submersed in what was going on um, and i feel like i could handle that really well so i think at 2000 I guess 2019, I was in about 90 airplanes uh, flying all over the East Coast with some of the reps that I was managing. And it was it was a whirlwind. I, I literally was living life like 2020 was going to have a pandemic. I felt like looking back and it was a wild ride and, and it all came to a screeching halt. And so, you know, someone who is very much an extrovert, someone who loves being around people, um, I, I suddenly had to kind of find joy in other things. To be honest with you, for the first time in my life, I did have to kind of deal with a little depression. I had to understand um, I'm not always going to get these outlets that I was getting before. I'm, I'm the kind of person who likes to go to the gym, you know, see my friends, have a workout buddy, not seeing my friends, not being able to work out, not traveling. Even um, my role was moved from a management role to working on some other projects. I think as uh, at least as as, as guys, I think girls too, they find um, a lot of self-purpose in how well they're doing in their role or how well they're doing at their job or even just staying active in, in, in projects and whatnot. So I think taking all of that away and there's only so many episodes of Tiger King before you have to really address what life is and what is this new normal and, and how long am I going to be doing this, et cetera. And so I was kind of forced to, to, to like look at my options and I, I just didn't see a future where I was. Thankfully, I had good friends and, and they connected me with somewhere. Through that process, I, I also realized that even though I was good at something, I, I didn't have a passion for it. And so that's something that I, I had to learn. And I'm just realizing it just now. Yeah, I just made the decision to make a move and to leave a company that I was only with for a year. And, and that could be tough. At the same point in time, I'd moved from one competitor to another. And I only have good things about to say about the organization. For me, it wasn't about whether I was good at it or not. For me, it had to do with like when I sleep at night, when I wake up, am I excited to do what I'm doing? Is this something that I feel like I'm making a difference? Does it feel like I am serving a purpose? I remember it was it was New Year's. Um, Here's night and, and I, I got a couple texts from some of my reps that I had managed. They said, you know, happy new year, you know, miss you and, and whatnot. And to be honest with you, I, I broke down crying, man. I, I, I was like 
what am I doing? Like, this is, this is not something that I want to be you know, doing. So I just, I texted all, all the reps that work for me. Hey, happy new year. And then I just sent kind of appreciation text. Like, Hey, I just loved everything that, you know, you did with this. And I loved your follow-up and you did a good job planning, whatever it was that they were good at. I just uh, sent an encouragement note there. Not long after that, I was like, man, I got to do something. So I interviewed for a couple, like, uh, pursuing my master's degree. I was literally at a point where I was like having to make a decision about what is my purpose. And that's what I'm kind of saying. This is right when I was going through some of this depression of like, what am I doing? I had to do some soul searching. I'm a man of faith. So I, I did kind of like sit back and, and try to um, kind of meditate as to what was going to be my future and try to, to visualize that and do a lot of prayer. But Ultimately, it just happened to be at the right place at the right time. I had a recruiter reach out and it made a lot of sense for me and my background. I've done some fitness competitions and I've helped a lot of people with coaching on nutrition and diet as well as also exercise. And then I've done some uh, background in value-based medicine. So uh, what I'm doing now is a perfect fit for me. So it's like that is when I knew it was the right point to make a move. I can say that uh, not all the moves I've made have been just that evident. So I feel very blessed in that respect. At the same point in time, uh, one of the encouragements that I would do, and I think this is, this is, we all get caught up in it, is just to observe your surroundings. And I think if you're able to do that, things will be much more evident to you. So a good example for you, I mentioned how I was on 90 airplanes in 2019. Um, one of the things I stopped doing, you know, in that start, stop, continue, I actually stopped wearing headphones walking into an airplane. Because for me, it's like, I, I I didn't know what was going to happen. Maybe the person next to me was going to start a conversation. Maybe I didn't want to be a part of, maybe I didn't. But uh, I, I was just going to be open to my surroundings, be available to the world around me. And who knows what would happen. I ended up having awesome conversations. I, I ended up being invited to a wedding uh, for this couple that was, they had all their family there going to Miami. So it, just like these crazy situations, we're living in a world. And we try to do so many things to try to keep ourselves comfortable and try to close ourselves off from everybody else. But um, I don't think that's how the world was meant to be. And so that's kind of why I proposed to you one of my tips and one of my biggest, um, I guess, uh, flags that I like to hold up is just being comfortable in the uncomfortable, being willing to try things new, being willing to just embrace the world around you and not feel like you have to kind of shelter yourself or, or close yourself off. I love that, man. That was that was a lot, but I love it. Uh, I want to go back a little bit because there's a lot of things that I want to say from that piece. One, I just want to mention that it's such a pleasure and joy to interview and have a guest that is so used to and comfortable with public speaking and meetings and all that stuff, because there's just a different dynamic that is there. That initial period of time where you have to like pull out all the questions from them and get them comfortable like you just get straight to it so first of all thank you for that second of all i want to say something that i think is absolutely fascinating that a lot of the viewers might not be aware of is that uh, michael and i used to work together at the same company a few years back we knew each other but it was almost just the name or in passing or at those big conferences you might just like shake their hand and have a drink together and that's it it's a very short thing so the fact that now we're in different roles, we've taken our own risks, we've done our own journey, and we have the opportunity to reconnect, start a new friendship, get to know each other at a completely different level, I think that's absolutely fascinating to me. One more thing that I want to mention, I'm curious to hear about you, is that obviously we were both in sales. It is very interesting to me, all the pieces that you said that you wanted to do and how you felt about, for example, you wanted something that had more impact. You wanted something that had more meaning. I just know from a lot of people that have gotten to know me, there's almost like this initial pushback that they have because they're like, oh, you used to be a sales rep or you are a sales rep or you're always selling, you know? I mean, it's kind of hard to turn off that switch for us because at the end, everything is a sale. Everything is a transaction, I would say. It's just so fascinating to me that you, as a, a fairly successful sales rep, could also take a step back and be like, it's not just about the money. Obviously, it's really nice when you get a great paycheck after a lot of hard work and you help the customer, but you actually cared about the end result. And I think that's something that's kind of being lost in today's society and a lot of modern day sales that I was viewed as like, oh, you're just, you would say anything to a customer for a sale. I'm like, absolutely not. That was actually one of my biggest struggles in my past few sales jobs where it's just like, it got to a point where that was like what was being encouraged. And I'm like, I just can't do that because I know that I'm going to have to look them in their eyes a year from now and tell them, yeah, 
it's kind of messed you up your business once i realized that it like could affect their livelihood their happiness especially now with covid you know everything is different no one knows what's going on even people like you and myself that kind of know what who we are and what we want can get affected like you had a minor depression or anything like that right because things are changing you have to completely alter your life and for me that was something that really resonated with me when you said right now is that as a sales rep who's been doing sales for a while and has had success could actually take a step back and you wouldn't just do anything for a sale. So I'm curious to hear a little bit more what your opinion is about that. Sure. Hey, man, you know, I think a lot of the advice that I, I gave my reps or that I would give anybody listening to this, I mean, I, I think they apply to real life as much, if not more than to a sales life. The reason I say that is like, I, I take a very honest approach into genuinely caring, genuinely like wanting to ask a question. I'm very curious in nature. So like when I'm in discovery, I feel like I'm in discovery all all day long the rest of my life. When I'm at like a party, I'm, I'm rarely the one talking. There's the, usually that guy who's off in the corner, you know, telling us great stories. I'm not that guy. I'm the guy who's like, hey, so, you know, I don't know anything about the insurance business. So like what happens here, you know, if you get to this and what do you get to that? To me, that all is a major part of whether you're in sales or, or in real life. And I think when it comes to helping our prospects or just working with people in general, they just want to feel that you care, you know? And I think if you take honest, genuine questions and you're inquisitive and you want to know, you're not just asking a question to get to where you want to go and to, to get to that point where you say, cha-ching, well, here you go. This is it all packaged up. I mean, heck, I've, there's been times where I've been ordering pizza and the guy's just like, oh, that's, yeah, you know, olives, that's interesting. Okay. You know, and they actually care. They're not just like checking boxes. The same thing with the doctors that I work with. If you truly care, I think it's genuine and you can sell anything. If you think about it that way, like I would, I feel like I would be a terrible SDR, just like calling people up. I like just having high quality, no rush, just have a great conversation. And when you guys leave, you have a bond and you can build off of that. I think that's hard to do. I did a lot of cold calling in person and I, I love that during COVID-19, one of the downsides, uh, well, first off, I'll say one of the positives because I always like to start positive. I've been really impressed with how businesses in general have been able to adapt. And so, um, you know, I was only there with uh, for this last organization for less than a year and I closed, you know, three deals. And these are large enterprise level deals. And so I've been really surprised how groups and whether the practices or businesses in general have still, still kept their decision making process, have kept like their business running very successfully. However, on the downside, when it comes to prospecting, everyone's sending emails, everyone's calling because they don't have that in-person ability. They don't have some of the, the conferences that they had, the events, et cetera. The one downside to you know COVID-19 is it's, it is hard to get people's attention. And that day trader of attention, a job that we have, it is very difficult to, to break the ice. And so from that perspective, still trying to figure that out. That part's not easy. But I think if you genuinely care about what you're selling and you're not desperate, I think people will be more receptive. So I mentioned to you one of the tools that I use is Vidyard. I just have a membership through them. They're not sponsoring this at all or anything like that. But for me, they should sponsor us. <laughs> they should sponsor you. That's an awesome idea. Um, I can put you in touch with the person I, I work with. But for me, it's a visual um, like thumbnail that's at the bottom of the email. It's actually a GIF, so it, it looks like any other picture that's in an email. But it's just like me waving and then someone can click it and then it, it shows me talking to them. For me, it's like, that's why I have this mic here. That's why I have some of this equipment is because for me, it's like, I have to show my face. I have to have that face, to, you know, eye contact and have that full discussion because that's who I am and that's the brand that I've developed. So, you know, I want to stay true to that, even if the world around me is going crazy. Question to you. So obviously a lot changed and I appreciate you sharing all that piece. Did you have Vidyard before? Or how did you kind of adapt to, because we went fully digital. And I think, yes, a lot of businesses adapted really well. I agree with you 100%. I mean, look at the world now. Everyone has kind of got used to it. And now we're starting to recover from it. We're slowly, slowly getting back to a new normal, not previous normal. But at the same time, like the world's going to be completely different, right? I mean, I don't even want to know how many people are going to have anxiety and depression and other mental health issues after this or social skill struggles. But that's a topic for another time. What I'm curious about is I know that a lot of things went virtually, like, you know, selling. You had to use exclusively phone calls and video chat and video chat especially kind of exploded 
So did you already have like some of this equipment beforehand? Did you get that because of COVID and you had to adapt and you learn? Because I would also argue that so many companies took a long time to adapt because one of the biggest things that I've noticed, and I know you said you've listened to a few of my episodes and stuff like that, but for those people who don't know, I've lived in six countries and I lived a diplomat kid life. So I have to constantly start over, start over, start over, start over. Starting over and taking a risk for me is not scary. The only thing that I need to know is that I'll have enough money to continue living the lifestyle that I want to live. That's all I care about because you don't want to sacrifice too much. You don't want to start like living in a homeless shelter while, you know, you're podcasting. That was the only piece that really affected me, you know, when I taking risk. But when you have to constantly start over, you learn, hey, you know what? I need to pay attention. I need to listen. And I don't need to be the guy that's always talking. Just pay attention to other people, kind of figure out the the room. And I felt like it took a lot of business, especially like in the restaurant industry, uh, like a while to adapt to that. I feel like the medical industry kind of adapted faster, but I'm kind of curious in your case, how do you feel like, was it very easy for you to adapt and change? And did you apply all these things to the digital world right away? Or was it something that you've already been used to from your past, like maybe even your childhood? Yeah, man, that's a, that's a good question. First off, kudos to you for having lived in that many countries and traveled that much and had to like reinvent yourself. Uh, I moved twice, maybe three times um, in my life. You know, when I was 12, moved from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to Charlotte, lived in Charlotte for five years, then Virginia Beach. Now I live in Richmond, Virginia. And even then I went to school in Williamsburg. I've had to move around a little bit, not as much as you. So you know way more about that than me. But I do think that there is something to that. I couldn't imagine just like living in that small town my whole life. And I think maybe maybe that nature versus nurture there does have an impact. But I, I would say for myself, um, I kind of do, and this is kind of a motif just in my own life in that for me, I'm constantly doing A-B testing. I'm keeping in my peripheral what I do well and what has been successful and what are those best practices. And then I make minor tweaks and, and I'm always kind of tweaking back to what I know and then trying something new. So when I talk about Vineyard, for me, that was a an A-B test. Like, hey, I'm getting a bunch of emails and I was doing, you know, I was using a tool called Sales Loft that allows you to kind of, you know, automate some of this and do cadences. And I was doing emails and then I was like, ah, I got to try this. And I would be trying, tweaking new emails, uh, styles. I would be like, hey, this isn't working. I'm going to do a bunch of calls this month and, and kind of keep similar messages. As I was doing those, there was one message that, that seemed to be working. And then I would tweak this and it'd be like, no, that's not working. Let me, let me keep this, but try this. And so you're constantly like revolving around. I think a lot of people do that. First off, I think that's not anything new. I think people in their minds, they're doing it more than they think they are. But I think what's important is to remember what those best practices are, because you can go totally the opposite way, try things totally off the wall and be like, whoa, where am I? Just You're just off in you know your own zone. But so I think there's a fine line between un when you're understanding like, this is the best practice. I know what works. I want to try this. And I think sometimes people want to try like an AM test like way too far and versus just like a tiny tweak and just being able to say well, let me try this opening or let me try this different subject line but everything else is the same so you know, kind of just making minor changes and you know eventually um i feel like eventually you'll get to what works if you're constantly doing that and i think that's kind of the approach i took just in this one example but it's also an approach i i feel like i take in life I don't want to get too far off in, in crazy land but you know a good example like say in the gym i'm not gonna be the guy who's like you know upside down, holding some weights, doing something weird. But I am the guy who like watch like an Arnold video. I'm like, oh, I like how he's like laying on a bench really awkwardly and flying out. I like trying new things. I like um, doing a tweak that's different than everybody else. I'm the guy that's, that's doing the weird thing that no one else is doing. And I like being good at it because I'm doing, I'm doing these minor tweaks. Another part around that, that I think also has to do uh, um, a, a little bit with this, but maybe not as much as I'm thinking in my own head, but I, I really enjoy the, the grind of things. I actually really like the, the, the progress. When I was in Pennsylvania, this is what I was good at. This is what I wasn't good at. And I, you know what? I didn't accept that I wasn't good at this. So I did this and this. And, you know, I, I think growing up, I was kind of a um, jack of all trades, master of none, because once I hit a point of diminishing or turn, it just became kind of boring for me. So I was like always trying new things. So I was always in like acting classes or music classes. I always had to be around creativity. 
Uh, but I also was lo loved math, but I liked to, to do like problem solve. I was that kid who, you know, on the SATs that had that weird, like walk 30 miles and you walk, like, I love that kind of stuff. That was like my favorite, my, I didn't like the boring math. I liked the creative math. And so I think from that perspective, um, you know, I, I really enjoy the grind. I like waking up at 5 a.m. And, and going to the gym, have that alone time. And then the rest of my world can go crazy because I at least had the other side of the coin, the solid aspect of my life, the consistency, because um, that kind of feels like it kind of counteracts. It's, it's, it was for me the, the center of things. So I'm kind of talking around a lot of what you're asking. I hope I'm able to tie it all together, but um, A-B testing, enjoying the grind, enjoying the process, enjoying the development from where you are to where you're trying to go to. So you say pretty much that's one of your first keys of advice that kind of brought you to where you are today. All of those things, A-B testing, enjoying the grind, enjoying the process. Like it's, it's literally is a work in progress always. Yeah, I think a good example would be, I think everyone wants to be standing on stage and win, winning an award, right? But <clears throat> I don't enjoy that part. That part's nice. Like I, I, I wouldn't say I don't like it because that's, I'm not, I'm not psycho. It feels great. There's no doubt about it, but that's not the goal. If that's what I was looking forward to, I would enjoy the process. So for me, it's like, I like honing my skill. I like um, perfecting my craft. I enjoy getting marginally better at something over time. And eventually when I'm on stage, it's more of a validation. Like when I close a big deal, it's actually more of a relief. It's like, all right, cool. I can focus on this now. I, I've been neglecting prospecting. I need to get back out there. I need to do this. Cause I, now I feel, I feel good. I feel relieved though. It's not like a, yeah, I, I earned this. Like, this is awesome. It's like a, whew, all right, cool. And now I can like focus on everything else I've, I've neglected over the last month trying to close this massive deal. So I think when it comes to enjoying the process, you're going to get burnt out if you're just going for that award ceremony. If you're not enjoying um, getting better at things, you're just going to hit a dead end um, or you're going to get to a point where a day where you just said, geez, like I need to do something now. And that's why for me, it's like whether it was applying for my master's or, you know, uh, I think in February, I decided I was going to reach out to 1,000 uh, prospects through customized emails where I was specifically looking at their website and making a point to go out of my way to uh, mention something specific that was going to grab their attention, not just, you know, uh, blanketed emails. Um, and you know what? I got burnt out. You got burnt out. I got burnt out doing this. But then I said, you know what? This is what I liked about it, which was uh, I, I did Vidyard. I, I did a couple things that I picked up on from doing that experience. So I'm always the guy who is willing to, to try something new because I know that if I pick up one thing, if I learn like two or three things, I'll consider it a success, even if other people see it as a failure. Well, I love that. I mean, that was exactly where I was going to this. So for me, you said a lot of things that I want to touch back upon. And one of the first things is obviously one of the themes that I am preaching and discussing with the Challenger brand and the podcast and all this stuff is really getting people to change your perspective and their view on failure. I think most people have it wrong. Like they view it as literally the worst thing in the world. And it's why they hesitate to ever try something new. Yet here you are talking about how A-B testing is one of the ways to go because it helps you enjoy the process, but it also helps you perfect your craft slowly, slowly over time. So my first question is, were you always into this? Because for example, I feel like it took me a long time to change my view on failure. I was always a little more open to it than I think, for example, like my siblings who live the same life as me and a lot of my friends. But in general, it's still like, man, when you put in your heart and soul and then it just didn't work out, you get down on yourself, especially just the way that I over, I used to especially be a notorious overthinker. I would pre-plan. I would try to uh, make sure that I cover all possibilities, things that could go wrong, and I'm prepared for anything. And then at the same time, I am very good at just improvising. So it's like, oh, there's no way anything could go wrong. And then all of a sudden, you know, you get a left hook jab, and it's like, you're knocked out. So I'm curious, like, did you always view failure lesson? Because I know, like, for example, past relationships, failed friendships, some of my first jobs, especially when I got into sales, it really changed my view. Like sales, was, I would say, would be the thing that really made me start viewing failure as a lesson because I'm like, okay, well, this happened, this happened. And then I could start applying it to my past life. And I'm like, well, it sucked that I had to move from Denver, Colorado when I was eight years old to Jamaica and I lost all my friends and I had to go there. And I was literally the weirdo. They're like, why is your skin like this? Why do you talk like this? Why is your accent like this? And I'm like, I have an accent. You guys have an accent, you know? Like there's all these things and it starts getting to, especially when you're a kid, you don't have like that confidence and that strength. And my parents didn't know either. 
how to support us during that because they were also figuring out they were also the weirdos for me it was something that i learned a lot later so i'm curious like for the a b test because i think that's absolutely fascinating i know i always did that with my sales as like you said people do without even realizing but for me sales was always fascinating because it was like a game of chess i'm like oh they just did this the the ceo texted me this i'm like well what's my play now and it's like well he didn't reply this time I'm like, okay, tomorrow I'm going to send this with a little this and this. And then now, oh, your plan would work and so forth. Like kind of see what works. I think because of all my experience growing up and getting to know people and getting comfortable befriending people very quickly, I became very good at what I would call, honestly, a superpower is the power of simulation. So I can kind of predict what's going to happen. So I'm like, if right now I told you, hey, Michael. You're like Queen's Gambit, just like going on the... The chess piece is on the ceiling, yeah. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, hey, Michael. <laughs> Part of my language, I'm like, you're a dick. I'm like, I don't like you. You did this. The way you talk about sales is just, you, you just bragging. And what's going to happen? You, you might actually hang up on this call if I just started going at you. But if I'm like, Michael, I think your advice is great. There's a lot of people that actually need to hear this because as much as they can resonate with my message, hearing it from you not only confirms it, it validates it as well. Now you have a different perspective and they might enjoy or relate to your story more because you've lived more of an, uh, more of an American lifestyle than I have. So maybe they need that. You're much more likely to respond. So you kind of like start figuring that out. Like if I did this, what's going to happen? Like if I tell the client, no, I'm not going to give you the discount. Are they going to stop talking to me? Or are they going to be like, okay, well, what can we do? You know, like th- I feel like that's kind of where I took AB testing is like, I thought about it like that, but long story short, A-B testing, did you always view failure as a lesson and how did you get to that? Yeah, you bring up a lot of good points. I will say that everything I've kind of mentioned is observed at different levels of maturity. You know, I don't think it's like something older or younger. It's like when the world was like, this is the biggest thing that's ever happened to me. It was a big deal. When I'm older and more mature and I've realized I've been through more losses, you just realize, okay, it's just another loss. And it's it's less of a big deal. It's kind of like that Wayne Gretzky quote. It's one of my favorite where you miss 100% of shots you don't take. From that perspective, it's like, you realize it's okay. Looking back, we worked together at the same organization, I don't know, two years ago, which isn't that long if you think about like your life. But I mean, if I made a mistake or if I failed in front of anyone there, there's no one that would remember that. I remember there's one time where I, I, I asked the question that was literally just said, but I wasn't paying attention. I felt like an idiot, you know, but at the same point in time, to me, that's something I remember. That's something I beat myself up about, but literally no one else remembers it. So I, if you think about things like that, no one else cares, like literally no one cares. So why should you? They're too busy focusing in on themselves and their own failures. They don't care about yours. Yeah, they'll point it out or jokey about it. But I do think it's just uh, just a maturity thing. It's just being willing to, to, to try something new and be considered in the short term a failure, but long term uh, a winner. So that kind of answers part of your, your question. I think it gets to the meat of what you're asking. Yeah, I do think, um, you know, I'm thinking about A-B testing. I, I, now that I've been doing it for such a long time, I almost wish I like wrote it down. It's like I, I have a wipe off board. I feel like now I should be writing down what those best practices are. So I, I don't ever lose track of them. But then one of the things that I think is important to understand is the difference between a, a static mindset and a growth mindset. So a, a static mindset would be, I take a test, you take a test, you score higher than me, you're forever smarter than me on that topic. Versus the growth mindset says, no, you are just smarter than me on that topic, or maybe even just more prepared for that topic at that one moment. So uh, there's nothing stopping us from taking the same test in a month and me scoring higher than you. It's not a a find or forever um, situation. So I think about things like in in that, just because I'm not good at golf now, doesn't mean I'm not going to be good at golf in 10 years. So whether it's picking up lessons or doing whatever I can to control what I can control to get better at something. That's what I'm talking about is honing my craft. I like to get better, incrementally better at things. I I hated seeing weaknesses. Um, And there's still some weaknesses that I'm aware of that I just avoid because I I know that once I do it again, I'm going to beat myself up until I get better at it. And I'm going to get addicted to getting better at something. From that perspective, um, you know, sports, sports are a great example. I remember one summer, um, 
Jesus. It was in Charlotte. So I was probably, I don't know, 13, 14 years old. For whatever reason, we just had a long summer and my brother and I found a tennis court down the street. And we both just like got rackets at Walmart. And, and one day we, we just started and we had a hard time getting the ball over. It was just literally like the most terrible experience of all time. But one of us would figure out a forehand and then that person had a competitive advantage for probably, you know, a day or two. Then that other person picked up how to respond to that. And then they figured out how to, you know, respond to it in a way that would put me at a disadvantage. And the next thing you know, by the end of the summer, we knew exactly how we were going to respond to things. We were playing at a, I wouldn't say a competitive level, but, you know, for teenagers, like it was a major improvement in just a matter of two or three months because we incrementally try to competitively get better at something. So I think that's the, the main perspective for me is like, just because you're not good at something now doesn't mean you can't get better at it. And I think anyone who thinks that they can't get better at something is only putting a cap on um, what their potential is. So I, I think that kind of goes along the A-B testing. You share a lot of great points. I think it, it brings to mind something that I think is what I call self-awareness. I think it's one of the things that is lacking the most in today's society is that you speak to, you know, there's certain things that you should try to improve on and always perfect your craft, but you're also open to change and realize just because you're not good at it today doesn't mean that you can't be good at it a year from now. So I have two questions about that. One is, do you feel like you've identified your strengths and your weakness? You know yourself and you've set yourself up for success. So for example, I always tell people, I know I am absolutely terrible at art. Like I literally cannot draw to save if my life depended on it. Like I would hope the stick figure. It'd be a, a stick drawing. <laughs> yep. Like that is like Pictionary. I, I always tell people I'm like, hey guys, can we just instead of when I have to draw, can I just act it out? They're like, you want to act it out? Can I talk it out? Like any of that stuff. I would love that. They're like, that's so much harder. Why would you want to do that? I'm like, it's not. <laughs> so that's one thing. And then two, I'm just like certain sports uh, after a certain point in my childhood. For example, if we had to play baseball or football right now, I would struggle. Now, soccer, I could probably do OK. But like those other things, we just started living in a lot of third world countries. So my parents didn't feel comfortable with me going outside and just like playing um, sports and hanging out with these kids in the middle of the night or whatever. So I stopped doing that a lot. So you don't really practice that. You become more almost like sedentary in some ways. So that's not one of my strengths. Could I improve it? Yes, but also it doesn't necessarily come naturally. So I'm like, okay, I would much rather spend my time perfecting my gift of gab and relationship building and stuff like that, because I realized those are my strengths. So I'm curious if you always kind of knew your strengths and weaknesses and you spend time like trying to get rid of your weaknesses, or you just are like, that is something that I could spend a year perfecting and I would only be still mediocre. Is that really worth my time? I see what you're saying. Um, the way I would I would say it is like, say a good example would be, you know, music. My mother played piano for um, many, many years and, and taught piano lessons. In fact, she taught like other people's kids for decades. And I uh, I took lessons for nearly that same period of time. And that was exciting, I guess, uh, technically. I mean, I got free lessons. I, everyone's got to love that. But I, I didn't I didn't enjoy it. I didn't find joy in it. So um, my mom knew that I didn't enjoy it. And I, I, I got a little bit better. But I hit that point of diminishing return. And I said, you know, I, I got here. I, I learned chords. I understand. I can play all the music you want me to. Like, in all sense of completiveness, like, it was done. I was there. And I could have gone on and, and, and done other stuff. But I didn't enjoy it. So... My mom had a coupon to, to play drums, and so I took a drum lesson at uh, the local, you know, guitar center or whatever it was, and took lessons for over two years. And I love playing drums. So, you know, for you, it may not be Pictionary; it, it, it might be like watercolors or some way that you're like able to express yourself using art. Um, you know, there's there's so many different ways to express yourself using art that isn't just you know drawing with a pencil or whatever. So. Um, could be clay. And a lot of people like molding clay or, or making um, pottery. So like that's the perspective that I have is like, hey, you may not like the the vanilla flavor, but you might like vanilla with Oreos uh, sprinkled in or chocolate chips. Just because you have to eat vanilla ice cream doesn't mean you have to eat it, you know, the way everyone else is eating it. And I know that analogy breaks down pretty quickly, but that's the perspective that I, I feel like I take. And 
I'm the guy that when I'm like bowling, I like to, to spin it as crazy as I can. I get more gutter balls than anybody there. But for me, it's like, that's fun and it's a challenge. And I also get cool strikes that everyone's like, Ooh, that's cool. If only you could do that every time. So from that perspective, I enjoy, I, li- I like to find things that are boring and try to make them uh, fun. I-, I just think that's how life was meant to be. You know, if you have to do something, might as well just in- enjoy it. So um, again, I think that kind of uh, answers a-, a little bit of your question, but ultimately don't feel like you have to meet- fit someone's mold. You can change the mold a little bit to find a compromise where they're happy and you're happy. Well, I think continuing on that part before I want to hear your next key takeaway, which I know we've probably already touched upon, but is really the topic of sales. What I mean by that is I feel like a lot of people don't even know that that kind of job exists. And let me share a little bit about that. So my dad being a Mexican ambassador and a diplomat and working for the foreign service wanted me to follow in his footsteps, which I get. I mean, he has connections. He can teach me. He can mentor me. He can guide me. He can make recommendations. And it can help a lot, but I just thought about having to move again every two to three years. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely not. I'm not going to do that. So I really couldn't, I didn't find what I really liked and enjoyed after college. I mean, I took business, I took communication. I know I loved like classes where like debate, public speaking, advertising, marketing, but I never really was aware of sales. And I know that my cousins that had moved from Mexico to the United States were in sales, but I didn't really know exactly what they were doing as like a teenager. So I remember when I first started looking for jobs that really would make me excited and passionate, I wasn't finding anything. Like I would do something and I'd get bored because it was so easy, but perfected right away. And I was working way harder than the other people. And I'm like, I'm getting paid the same as them and they're just slacking off. And then like, that was a huge thing, which it's crazy thing now that we do sales is like, I I found this timeshare marketing slash sales job and it was ridiculously challenging, but it was the talking about travel, getting people excited about that. And that was my life. So it was amazing. And I could meet literally like a hundred people a day and get to stop them, talk to them and convince them, Hey, you should probably consider this and, you know, forming relationships, friendships, it was absolutely insane. It kind of was like an unlock for me. And I'm like, this is something that I could do. Plus, the harder I work, the better I do, the more money I make. That's awesome. So that's kind of how I got into sales. So I'm curious about you because um, there is also a part about burnout that I want to get into after because you mentioned that. And I think that's really important because, again, now I'm not doing it. I mean, everything is sales. We talked about it. But in a way, I burned out as well. But I want to hear kind of like, what was your journey into sales? And what would you say was the part that burnt you out? Yeah, man, that's a good one. So um, I think everyone as their teenagers has that person who just nags. What are you going to do when you grow up? What are you going to do when you grow up? You know, I didn't know uh, what I wanted to do, but I ended up, you know, moving right as my senior year. So I ended up going to the community college, getting my associate's degree first. And, you know, it was just a broad business degree. Uh, and then I transferred to, to William & Mary. It's a... It's college here in, in Virginia. And I went to the, the business block and, you know, you, it's at that point in time, I'm like, I'm getting business major. This would be perfect. I'm going to be doing some business. Yeah. And you're like, I know exactly what I'm doing now. And you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, so I like, got ah, finance isn't for me, you know, accounting is not for me. So I went in, uh, they had just gotten rid of like, an IT degree and they had this consulting degree. I, I also had a marketing degree. So it was like a double major within the business school, but I actually loved uh, this new consulting degree. They had process management consulting is what it's called. So we did Excel database management. I, I learned how to like, actually, I'm one of those guys who loves Excel and just like loves learning V lookups and, and an awesome table. So I could talk to your ear off on that. You don't want to know, but I hated the actual like uh, data management. So I could never be like that guy. So, um, that part was cool, but then also like marketing, I liked the creativeness of it. When I graduated though, all, all the jobs were up in, up in Richmond here. And so I started actually working for a technical recruiting company. It, you know, it's around that same time that I met my now wife and her ex-boyfriend, like all, most of her ex-boyfriends were like in healthcare sales. She would always be telling me the stories where like they're watching ESPN every afternoon and just like, just working about two or three hours a day and, and would show up to their, their hospitals and, you know, get their devices. I was like, man, what if someone gave like 110% to that? Like they'd be making so much more because I already knew that they made a decent amount of what they were doing. So I had a mentor at the time. Shout out to, to Chris Sweeney. He's, he's been awesome. 
sat down with him. He had a, a very glorious career in healthcare sales. I said, I want to get into healthcare sales. I know I would crush it. I love the healthcare aspect of it. Um, what should I do? And he said, if you could sell a commodity, you can sell anything. So whether it was, you know, paychecks and I ended up selling copiers for about um, two or three years. Actually, I think it was close to three or four, which is way longer than I thought I'd be selling copiers. But I was successful at it. And one of the things that I found out while I was there is I really liked the document management software that was on the copiers that could help businesses be able to be more organized instead of just print. It's not all just printing. It's like, I want to be more organized. I want to be able to scan into something that I was able to, you know, um, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to bore you with that. But I, the point is, is that I, I found the, the lane I was in and I found the sub lane that I actually found very passionable. I don't think that's a word, but give me some grace here. So I found the the lane that I was passionate about within the larger lane that I was supposed to stay in. And so, you know, I, I made my number by selling document management software and I was the only one who was selling it. That That's kind of how life is. You find the joy in the the variation of the, the larger thing that you're having to do. And so from that perspective, I liked the software part of document management. So when I moved into healthcare sales, I was looking for software healthcare sales. And so I, I found... Yeah, you know, the company we worked at and was successful there and, and I've stuck with it. I, I, I like the software, but I also like being able to make an impact on people's lives. I further tweaked and now I'm, I'm finally where I am. But I, I started out here and then I finally got here. And I, I think that also kind of goes into the part B of your question, which is how do you avoid getting burnt out? For, for me, it was like I, I had to find that sub lane. I had to find what I'm passionate about. I like to gamify everything. So for me, it's like... You know, I told you in February, I was like, I'm going to reach out to 1,000 prospects this month. I'm just going to do it. It's going to be a challenge. Maybe in March, I don't do any, and it'd probably be better for me to reach out to 500 and 500. Absolutely, probably. But for me, like that was the goal, and I was going to stick to it. It already came out of my mouth, so I had to fully commit to it. Um, but I mean, these are like the challenges. You find uh, a way to, to gamify something. You find a way to find joy in something, whether it's you know uh, something that you enjoy. Like for you, for art, it might be making a clay pot. There's that those things in life. You don't have to do everything ever the way that everyone tells you, but there are certain things you have to do. You have to probably pay rent and you probably have to, you know, get a house. But if you like a tiny house, get a tiny house. Like no one has to tell you what to do. Um, you just, you know, find what you find joy in and don't worry about making other people happy. That's a great answer. I mean, the first thing that sticks out to me is that you kind of got into this from other people telling you, I mean, I always find it fascinating to hear how salespeople got into sales because I don't think like most people start off, I'm going to be a salesman, like unless their dad was, I feel like that's not really something that most people think. I know I always was like, I would love to get paid to talk to people, but everyone just kind of laughed at me when I was a kid. They're like, yeah, that's not a thing. You don't just get to get paid to hang out with people. I'm like, yes, I do. <laughs> but I, I think that, I really resonate with the fact that you said you kind of like had a mentor and that's kind of what happened to me as well. And I had my, my cousin who was doing medical device sales and he, I kind of saw how he did and what he did. And I'm like, man, that's really cool. I like, it's, that's awesome that this company trusts him to like travel to places and represent the face of the company. And I know he was making bank too. And I was motivating, and inspiring. So it, it was kind of through him where I also started realizing that. So it's, it's interesting that we both had like this mentor figure that kind of, encouraged us and guided us along. One of the parts that truly, truly resonated with me that you said near the end was the part about challenging yourself. And I think too many people almost feel the need. And I would love to hear your opinion because I know I've keep talking about it on the Challenger podcast is people almost feel this need to not change. Like they are who they are, like figured themselves out when they're like 28 or 30 or whatever, whatever age, it doesn't matter. And that's who they are. They befriended like 20 different couples and families, and they all know them as that person. There's literally no way that they can change from that. Now, all of a sudden, two years later, let's say you are now a drummer in a band and you changed your hairstyle and you no longer wear dress shirts. People are going to be like, well, what happened? Like, we don't like you anymore. What's your problem? And like, you're still the same guy. You still talk about the same things. If we had a, a conversation like this, you would be able to talk about all this. But people are like, oh, no. He's completely different. Like, what the heck? Like, they almost, like, demonize it. And my question to you is, I feel like too many people stop challenging themselves. They figure it out. I know at that software company that we worked at, I mean, things changed with the pandemic. But before then, I feel like I had come to a point where I finally figured it out. 
Like there was this repeatable process that I could do that could pretty much guarantee a sale as long as they have money, <laughs> you know, like I could have a process and they would respond well to it. But then I'm like, well, I, the pandemic forced so much change, product change, and you have to learn how to sell something else. It was very exciting actually for me to re-challenge myself. But I know a lot of my coworkers just ended up doing the same exact thing and they were struggling. And I'm like, well, this is a new challenge. Why don't you um, rise up to it? And it, that causes so much change. So I just, I guess what I'm trying to ask is if you embracing challenge was something that always came naturally to you, because I feel like I know a lot of people that don't like that. They want it to be easy. They want their job to be on autopilot. I feel like once I get to that point, that's when I get bored and I want to do something else. So I want to constantly improve because if I'm already succeeding today and I figured it out, well, I could get better. You know, I could challenge myself. Like, let's say with this podcast thing, I'm like, well, how can I figure out how to do more episodes? How can I reach more people? How can I increase the exposure? Like we might be killing it today, but why can't we kill it even more tomorrow? You know? So I'm curious to hear about that. Yeah. I think, I think people don't like change in general. In fact, even I'll be honest, I, I don't always like change to start. To me, it's like, I was telling you about earlier, there's things that I'm not good at that I'm aware I'm not good at, and I'm not going to try it until somebody says, hey, let's all start doing this. And I'll say, all right, you know what? I, I know that I'm not naturally good at, or gifted at it, but I'm actually looking forward to finding that little sub lane that I, I do enjoy. And so for me, it's like, I'd be almost like a, a curiosity joy of like, I know I'm going to like some facet of this new normal. I'm kind of excited to find out what that is. I think from that perspective, you have to be able to adapt. I mean, I think, in, especially in sales, I think sales is probably one of the most adaptable parts of business um, out there. Same with marketing too. Gary Vaynerchuk um, talks about, you know, we're day traders of attention. Uh, and, you know, one of his names to fame was that he was, you know, one of the first to do like Google ads back in the 90s when everyone wasn't doing that and everyone was doing it. And he had wine.com. And then when everyone else was doing it, then he got into Facebook. And then it, it, everyone was on Facebook. Then everyone who back in the 90s was mailing things to people's homes. Now no one was mailing. So he's like, I'm going to go back there and now I'm going to start mailing people things. So it's kind of like uh, you have to do the exact opposite of what everyone else is doing or you're not going to get the attention. So, you know, I, I'll be honest, you know, th this morning I, I checked my vineyard and like the last three videos had zero views, meaning that the last three prospects I emailed out didn't see it. So I said, hey, you know what? Scrap where I thought this A-B testing was going. I'm going to go back to where that best practice was. So I looked back and I literally watched the last video that somebody watched. I said, why would someone watch this? What was different about this than, than what I just tried? That is something you have to realize is like, Hey, I've gotten too far away from that best practice. I do need to back up, get back to my roots, get back to that center and then start back out from there. I think though, if, if you aren't in that growth mindset, you're going to probably think that way where you're going to say, I'm going to keep doing what I know. If people are really like that, um, they may not enjoy sales because you, you really have to adapt. I mean, there are so many other things you could do every day that, that you don't have to change. You can, you can keep doing the same thing every day. And what I love about sales is that you can be creative. You can try things that are new. And honestly, the new things are, are celebrated. Now, when I talk to people about Vigor, they're like, geez, you know, no wonder I'm not closing deals. I'm like, Hey, I'm not guaranteeing you close the deals. I'm just trying like, this is one thing that you can have under your belt. One piece of your arsenal that you can, you can try. And if it doesn't work for your audience, like it may not work for, uh, you know, if you're selling bulldozers, it's probably not going to work for you. They might not have like a laptop in front of them or something. They can just click on things. So I don't know. It's, it's things like that where things don't always work for everybody the same. Um, but I think to your original question is for those people who um, are closed minded and kind of have that static mindset. I, I, I can't give you advice on to how to think outside the box. All I can recommend is try something new that you enjoy. And if you enjoy it, enjoy getting better at it. And I think if you, if you enjoy it and you enjoy getting better at it, I think the change would be much more welcome today than, than it has been. I think, well, one Vidyard would love to talk to you guys. I think that's so cool, by the way, that they have, um, a video thing. For example, I know that I always just completely kicked ass with customers. Like they loved it when you know, I was there in person and you can 
hang out with them. And just because of my Mexican German heritage, I would always be like at the end, like, Hey man, I'm a hugger. And like people would be a little uncomfortable at first, but now they're like, Oh, are we ready at the point where we're hugging? I'm like, okay, I get. And then, you know, that that's just completely different. They're giving me their cell phones or whatever. And people are always really like, shocked. Like, how did you get this super cool person? Dude, that was something that I really could r- fully embrace in person. And then you go full digital. It's a little more challenging to do so. So kind of eliminating that barrier. And there's just something different about like, if, you know, I just think back to I've got a Peloton recently so that I could actually at home because like you said, the gym's being closed. And like after 50 rides, you get a, uh, a message from one of the instructors on video by email. They're like, hey, congratulations on your 50 rides. We appreciate you. Thanks for being part of the family. You're making progress. Remember to check back to where you, you know, it's just something like that. And yes, I know that it wasn't just made exclusively for me, but the fact is that they had that video message. It It hits differently. I'm like, I know what they're doing and it still hit differently. So imagine someone who's not aware of what is actually happening in the background and why they did that, how they did it. That's just crazy to me. And I think that's a really cool thing that just sets you apart because at the end of the day, people pay attention to things that are different. So I love that. And then two, I just kind of want to summarize because I know it's been a great conversation, but it sounds to me like from everything we've talked about, I would say that another key advice that you would have is approach this growth mindset. Don't be static embrace growth, embrace change, and just really get comfortable with being uncomfortable because it puts you in scenarios and situations where you can actually improve. Yeah, one other thing, I, as you were talking about that, maybe it's just this, I think this generation in general does so many things to keep themselves comfortable. I mean, if you think about like half the things that are bought and sold are just like pillows that just are a little bit more contorting to the head or everything's just a little bit more comfortable than that last thing that was already there. I feel like everyone's keeping themselves boxed in. I I think people are afraid to fail and I get that part. That's very natural. But I also think, and this might be, I I just thought of this and I, I hadn't reviewed it with you. So hopefully you don't mind me going this direction, but I think people take themselves too seriously. I'm pretty self-deprecating. I don't take myself too seriously. I, like I said, I, I know more things that don't work than, than work. And I think if you're willing to you know put yourself out there and, and willing to reveal yourself, like you, geez, in the first four minutes of being on this podcast, I talked about you know me going through a depression. You have to be willing to be yourself and be transparent. I think whether you're in sales, people appreciate that. People don't want the Facebook version where you're just only posting or you know, Instagram version of yourself where you're only paste, posting the highlights. If you think about any hero that we've, um, that we're drawn to, they go through a point where uh, some type of low, they go through some valley where they learn something about themselves. And then like the Phoenix, they rise, but we were with them in those low moments. And I think you have to sometimes be willing to take people through the low in order to take them to the high. You know, in sales, I always have to, I'm always willing to just say, hey, this company that I'm at is not the best at this. And when I say that, then they're like, okay, so all the things that he's telling me that they're good at, it's true because he's he's now, there's some kind of like good and bad. He's not just telling me all the great things that this company does and just shoving a bunch of sales jargon at me. Um, he's being he's being transparent. He's lowering his guard. I've been known over the years as a good closer. And I think the only reason that I've been good at that is because uh, whether it's at the negotiation table or at closing, that person, that prospect is always on my side of the table. I'm always like their advocate. And I'm saying, hey, I'm going to talk to my leadership um, about you know, getting you this discount. I know what they're going to ask me, though. They're going to ask us this. What do you want our response to be? I'm on your side of the, the desk. Like, let's get this done. I want this done. You want this done. It's that empathy. I mean, just the worst thing you can do in negotiation is tell somebody that you're good at negotiating because then they're going to be like, all right, now I'm going to screw you over just for absolutely no other reason other than to show you you're not good at negotiating. Where if you come in just like, hey, can you help me out here? I'm trying to get this and trying to get that. I think we could use this on our side of, of the deal, Mr. And Mrs. Prospect. I think that type of empathy goes a long way. And that also translates to life. I even have a hard time, you know, even being on a podcast where I'm giving advice because I don't want to be that guy who's just like, you got to do it this way. You got to do it this way. I'm not that guy. I'm the guy who's just like you. I've been there. I've done that. I just have, I've learned a couple things I want to be able to, to pass along. So hopefully somebody doesn't have to go through the same mistakes as me, but I think ultimately you, you can't take yourself too seriously. Um, or, or else everyone will want to shut you down. Everyone will want you to fail because they hadn't seen you fail, even though you've already failed behind closed doors. I love that. There really is something to be said about people taking themselves too seriously. 
I mean, once you're able to laugh at yourself and just relax, I mean, everyone makes mistakes, everyone. And this was something that really kind of started turning me off towards these big corporate jobs and these non-startups and stuff like that was the fact that everyone took themselves so seriously. Yes, there's something to be said about professionalism. I love it. I think it's amazing because you get things done and you have a certain quality that you can expect. But once it got to the point where it's like, well, I can't tell the customer this, or I can't say this. Well, why? You guys are all thinking this. Why do we have to pretend that we're saying something else or thinking something else? And I know I rattled a lot of feathers during my time there because I always embraced the approach of just brutal honesty. If a customer was like, well, what happened here? Why did this happen? Well, you know, our project management just completely dropped the ball here, but we're going to find a way to make this work. So what do we need? I'm going to go talk to them. I'm on your side when I was doing that, like I really was on their side because I'm like, you know what? You guys need this. Like they absolutely need this product. You need this help. You really are like struggling a little bit to pay for things, but you'll need that ramp up of money after three months of having this success with this product. So let's do it. Like, what can you afford? What can we do? Let me go fight for you up there. I know that sometimes the leadership and certain bosses were like, well, you should be more on our side. You should be trying to get more money and make the deal worth more. So we make more. Why are you helping them? And it was always like a struggle because then you have to be better about pitching it to your own bosses so that they don't realize that. But to me, it was just like, I wasn't afraid of that brutal honesty of saying what it is like good or bad. And like you said, I feel like people appreciate that vulnerability and it's hard. It really is. Like you said, the social media, like the Facebook, the Instagram, the highlight reel, people are so used to that part. Well, all of a sudden you like show like, well, you know what? I got laid off last month and I haven't found a job. I just got turned down by three jobs. And, you know, now I'm feeling a little depressed. Like, obviously, you don't have to share everything. There's some benefit to, you know, keeping the mystery alive and being private. But people really resonate with that because they're like, oh, this guy who I thought has everything figured out is actually a normal human being until he rises like a phoenix, which, by the way, I love that analogy. I think there's really is something to be said about that. I feel like that a lot of times being underestimated. I actually like it. Um, I don't know how you feel about that, but it's kind of cool to be like, no one would expect this from you. Like they all think you're going to do this. And then you just come out. I'm kind of curious before we move to the next part about talking about like your vision and the idea of success, but going to more of this startup, I'm sure some people are going to be like, Hey, well, why are you doing that? Why would you do that? Why would you give up like these insane corporations and potential? Do you almost feel like that's you rising up and it's like, Hey, this is what I want to do. This is who I really was, but you guys just never really understood. Or tell me more about that. Yeah, so a couple things. Um, one, from a startup perspective, I've always been, you know, one of the top reps. And so for me, it was always good to be in a large sales field because I knew they would appreciate where I was. So, you know, being the, the top rep at a two rep company isn't as meaningful as a top rep at a 15 rep company. So I, I've been focused in on that in the past. One of the things that I would highly recommend if you do have a conversation with a recruiter or look into some type of sales role, find one where you can earn equity. From that perspective, like the commission is good in the short term, but none of it's life changing. I think equity and being able to build a business, um, it's like, it's okay if you're rep one out of two and you're building a company that goes public and later on you're rep one of 15, that's, that's awesome. That's way better than doing anything else. What I'm looking forward to the most is that every sale is going to be extremely impactful for the entire business. In like a 20, 30 employee company, like you make a sale, everyone knows about it. Everyone's celebrating. Everyone is excited um, because you're creating different bottlenecks and different sides of the business. And they're like, they get pumped about it. And I think that's very different than in a corporate job where you hit your number one month and it's like, cool. Two months later, it's like, what have you closed here lately? So from that perspective, there's a different aspect there. And there's also a different culture too. Knowing that you're a part of something that you're literally like lifting up off the ground. I'm really looking forward to getting more involved with them. And especially the industry that we are, where we're really tr providing true care to patients and making an impact on patients' lives like that. This is going to be so exciting because we're all doing it together. And I think that's very different. I, being on the corporate side, selling healthcare technology, you always had the sales versus professional services. I can't believe you sold on this. And like, it, it just, it's, it's way different. One of the reasons I made this, this role changes is, is 
to be in a role where I can, when I make sales, I'm making a major difference in the lives of customers and the lives of patients that these practices are serving, but then also make a, a huge impact in the, the company I'm working for. And then hopefully I'm making a huge impact in my family when that equity you know gets to us a certain amount of money. I know we have certain targets and I know what that payout will be. And so I'm working my butt off for that one day. I know in the meantime, I'm going to be uh, reimbursed. You have to be willing to understand if that's, if that's right for your family. I say goodbye to a couple of colleagues last week and, and they're like, I'm just getting out of that window of, of where I'm able to take risk as a family. And not everyone's able to do that. To go to a startup, you have to take one step back, take two steps forward. Uh, thankfully, this one was actually a step forward um, in order to hopefully take a lot of steps forward. But uh, that's not always the case. I understand that. And so from that perspective, there's just a major difference there. I will say, you know, there's going to be different things that you miss from that, that corporate life. The one thing that I, I know that I can't do going forward is there's no hiding in a small company. There's no like in my annual year, I can take, you know, a week or two off. It's like I was on vacation a couple of weeks ago and I want to hit the ground running. Um, and I know that I'm not going to be able to, to hide. Not that I was before, but you know, you know what I'm talking about. In a corporate company, you're, it's so big that um, sometimes you can get lost in the numbers. And that, that comes with both pros and cons. So I hope that gives you a little bit of inf information about uh, why I made that decision. I mean, ultimately, it, it came down to uh, being at the right place at the right time and, and being aligned with, with what I'm passionate about. The fact that it was a small business that was just icing on the cake. I love that so much because... You know, I feel like we get ingrained in our mind that we have to keep uh, making more money, more money, and it's all just about the money. And yet, it's amazing. And, you know, there's a lot of upside with your move. So I think that's even better. But there's just something to be said about creating something, creating a legacy, knowing that your impact was part of the reason. Like, obviously, I don't know everything about this business that now you're starting with, but it's like, hey, like you get a big sale or you get a big customer, like now they might be able to hire 10 more employees. They might be able to open a new department. They might be able to expand to another city. And you are literally affecting so many other people's lives. And there's just something to be said about that. That is, in my opinion, amazing. So I love that so much and I respect that. And I really hope that it works out for you because that sounds really cool. I want to touch upon one thing that I think is a very misunderstood part about life. And it's like, what is success? How do you get successful? And obviously that's part of the thing that I want to explain to people, but I want to kind of change that definition because I think too many people view it as, oh, that means that I am the CEO of this big corporation. You could argue that that guy is successful, but is he really successful? Like, did he sacrifice everything in his life? Now he's unhappy. He's depressed. Like, I would argue that that guy truly isn't successful because what if he just loses his job because something happened at the company and now his head rolls and what does he have, you know, and he destroyed everything else to get there. I think there's something to be said about us changing our view on success. And I know this is not like completely foreign. A lot of motivational speakers talk about this, but I think that it's such an important concept because their habits and it really is about figuring yourself out, getting the self-esteem that no matter what happens, you're going to be set up for success. But I want to hear your take on the challenger definition. And then I want to hear your opinion on what success means to you. So I have to read it because I always forget my exact wording. But it really is <laughs> the point of where you feel great with what you have currently accomplished in life. So you're happy with yourself. You're happy with your worth, the value that you provide. And you don't need other people's validation to feel like you're successful. So that is our definition. Curious to know what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I I love um, I love that mentality. It aligns with what I've uh, been talking about all along. You know, I don't really even think about success. Success is like that afterthought I was talking about. It's for me like success is a validation of what I already knew or or the the joy that I've already found. To give you a perfect example, you know, I was depressed, and it's hard even just like saying it out loud, but. I had to take control over. I couldn't just say, you know what, this is what it is. Like, I'm going to just keep doing this until I'm successful. No, I said, I'm going to take control of what I can control. I'd rather be happy at, at something that I'm enjoying and mediocre or like, you know, in the world's terms versus successful at something that I hate. I've seen so many executives over the years, like just be at the office until whatever. And they, they have a divorce and they go through all this. I, I hang out with them at, for drinks afterwards and... They're just not, I, not all of them, but many of them just aren't happy. 
And there are other people that are there, they're clocking in, clocking out, and then spend as much time as they possibly can, can with their family. I, I would almost rather err towards that second option. But I, I do think that there is an ability where you have to be on and when you're at work and you have to be able to flip it off. I know there's many times where I have my phone I, and I know that people have a lot of great tips of you know, turning off their email, turning off their phone, you know, when they're at home, I can't always do that. But sometimes I'm like, I just, I'm not going to respond to any emails until the morning. No deals are going to be signed right now. Everything, almost everything can wait till the morning. Now is my time with my family. Now is my time to do this. And if I can't enjoy this moment um, without thinking about all these other things and these clouds over my head, then it's not even worth being here. So another good example I joined a softball league uh, two years ago. Um, I don't play softball. I played little league when I was like a child and I, I started playing softball and I was like in my right field and they were like, please, no one hit it towards them. By the end of the year, like I won the MVP on the team just because I brought spirit, I brought energy I, and I wasn't the best, but I was, I was bringing it. I ran around the bases for everybody because that was the one thing I knew how to do. I was like, I know how to run. I know how to stop. I'm going to do that on behalf of the team. It's like those kind of moments, like where you have to, even if you're not good at something, you have to try. And if you're passionate about it, people pick up on that. People appreciate that. I think the same thing is, you know, with, with life, you have to be able to find that joy. And if you're at home and you're not finding joy, you need to find out why there's no joy there. You know, maybe it is, you know, spouse related, or maybe it is due to your house and your physical home during the COVID-19, we did a lot of, uh, we did a lot of things around the house. We actually put a pool into our deck. There was a hot tub platform underneath it. We put a pool for my five-year-old and three-year-old to be able to, to splash around in. It's only like two feet tall. I just was not going to to live with the fact that I couldn't go to some neighborhood pool. I was like, I'm going to put a pool anywhere I can put pool. Otherwise, we're just having a puddle of water somewhere because uh, it's going to be too hot to not do something. So, you know, it's, it's those kind of things where you just, you take control of your life. You find joy where you can. And if people call it success, cool. That's whatever, you know, it's icing on the cake, but if you're happy and you're finding joy in things and that's all that matters. I think that's a perfect way to, to end it on that note about the success piece. That's awesome. I love that you take control of the situation at the end of the day, are you going to do something about it or are you just going to complain? And it's hard. We talk about it like, you know, Hey, we got it all figured out, but I know both of us have, like you said, it happened to you recently up and down. So Guys, it's not just immediate. It's not just always. It's always a constant fluctuation. But that's the cool thing about it. You know, find your passion. And this leads me to the final thing before we go with our goodbyes and our takeaways is what are your thoughts? I mean, you've really touched upon it throughout the entire episode. And I love that. But it's one of the things that I live my entire life, especially basically since I've graduated college, I've had this mantra of always be improving. So kind of want to know what is your take on that? And do you feel like it's almost like maybe dangerous when you always want to be changing and growing and improving? Or is it just something that more people should approach? My fear is that people will hear that. And they'll say, Yeah, that's what you want to do. I can't do that. And they'll they'll think like that is how you're wired and they're wired differently. And they, they can't get to that point. And I think that's up for debate. And I think that you do a good job of, of saying, Hey, I think everyone, <clears throat> everyone can, can improve. And so that's why everything I've been talking about has been like, Hey, you don't always have to improve the way everyone else is telling you to improve. If, if you're going to find joy in something, why wouldn't you want to improve? Why wouldn't you want to do things your way? I think we live in a very expressive world where it's, it's perfectly okay to do things your style. As long as you're in that lane, you can be all the way to the left or all the way to the right. As long as you're in that lane, you follow the rules to a certain extent. And, and you that's why I've mentioned, I always, no matter what role I'm in, I always want a manager who gives me creativity to do things my way. And if I've ever interviewing for somebody and they're like, nope, we want you to do it this way. We have this process. You cannot do it your way. You are not allowed any creativity. I, I'm not going to be a good fit. I have to have structure. I have to have lanes, but I want the liberty to do it my way. So you know, I, I think from that perspective, I, I'm with you. I, I feel like everyone can be in that growth mindset. If you if you acknowledge that you're in that stat mindset. So for me, I always like thinking like, what does that sound like? So I know I had a friend of the family who just was like, hey, you know, this is me. You know, either love it or hate it. Like, this is me. I'm not changing for anybody. I'm like, 
that's not like a way that anyone should be living life. And actually it makes my blood boil a little bit when I hear that, because I'm like, everyone should be trying to improve and get better at things. If, if we just have to accept each other as the 14 year old version of ourselves that we th thought we figured out, that's not going to get us anywhere. But if we're always trying to improve, I improve, I think everyone appreciates that. Like that superhero story, people know that they're like, you're not perfect. And I think that's also another, another part too, is, you have to be willing to, to let your guard down and let people see um, that other side of you. And if, if so, then that improvement, people are going to celebrate with you. And people are going to be like, yeah, dude, I remember you last year. You were like literally hating life and now you're doing this. I'm so happy for you. And, and But they can't be so happy for you. In fact, they want to tear you down unless they know where you came from. So um, that would be just my encouragement is that if you're going to be growing, if you want to be constantly improving, Find a way that you can find joy in it and that you can improve and, and love it. Uh, and also take people along for the ride. Exactly. I think that's the key that you said that there's like this misunderstanding of people like, well, I can't do that. And it's because I think people just hear that and they're like, oh, it has to be like major improvements. Like if I'm 10 pounds overweight, now I have to be like fit. I'm like, no, maybe you just exercise once a week now. And before you never exercise, that's already an improvement, you know, and I think it's rewiring your mindset and just changing your view on it. Like even small little things are the key. And that's at the end of the day, what brings us to make changes in our lives and grow. Because if every day you just do a little change, a little change, I know I'm sure you can relate, especially considering you were doing fitness related stuff and nutrition. It really is the small things that add up over time. And then eventually once it becomes a habit, it's easy, but it's getting to that point. Everyone wants the six pack abs. No one wants to actually do the crunches. Exactly. So with that said, Michael, um, this has been an amazing talk. Uh, I love everything you've had to say, your response to it. I want to shout you out, first of all, for reaching out. I want to hear your take on something that I've kind of noticed that um, it's, you know, we're figuring this out as well. This is a new journey, but I feel like a lot of people uh, are paying attention, are watching, are listening, but a lot of people are hesitant to reach out or to start this journey or to share their take on it, or maybe it, it resonated with them, but they might not publicly acknowledge that. And I, I feel like there's almost like this fear of showing that, like like you said, that vulnerability, that weakness, like, hey, I portray to the world that I have everything figured out, yet here I am, and I feel pretty darn insecure in my job. Like everyone makes me feel like inferior or something. So I'm kind of curious, you reached out, you were on this journey to, to do this new job. You were leaving something that probably most people were like, oh, hey, even if this new thing is even more prosperous and successful, like you were leaving something that most people would be like, How, why would you leave that? You have your life set. You took a risk. And I'm curious to know what was it that kind of motivated you to, you know, reach out and be inspired to do this? Because I, I mean, did you ever feel like a moment of hesitation when you're like announcing like this big change and you're doing something new? Or was it just easy for you? Yeah. <clears throat> I think, you know, like for you, I think I just said, Hey, I mean, I love what you're doing. If you ever need a, a guest, I do know that though, that person who's like, Hey, can I be a guest on your show? That wasn't my intention. My intention was like, I just want you to know, like you're doing a good thing. I, I also know like it's hard to create content all the time. So, you know, it's, if you need help with that, I'm happy to help you out. Uh, but I think I, it's just another way that I was putting myself out there. And I think that's, that's, that's the part is like, you know, I would often take just calls from recruiters, even if I was happy, just because, you know, I never want to close a door that hasn't even been opened yet. So like, that's the perspective I, I like to take is just same thing with the, the headphones in the airplane. Just like, I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe I don't want to talk to that person, but I would rather have that option to talk with that person than not talk with that person. So it's kind of that mindset where it's like, you just have to be open-minded. And I think that's the hardest part that I have with COVID is, I miss those interactions with people. I miss like at the gas station, you know, having those interactions and not everyone does. I know I'm an extrovert. I, I enjoy those things. So I miss being able to be, you know, a manager and being drop shipped into an opportunity and, and, and being able to meet a physician and, and hear what his problem. I know to a certain extent, he's going to be feeling one or two, three, four different pains. Uh, and I can kind of hone in on that, but I, I, I I'm excited. I, I actually loved walking into and cold calling a, a private practice and just say, I don't know what's on the other side of the store, but I've trained my butt off. I know my talk tracks. I know what I'm going to say. So I'm excited to see which one, which, which objection he gives me. 
because I want to see the reaction when I give them, you know, the objection uh, handling response that I've developed for that. So for me, it was like, I, I enjoy those interactions with, with other people in life um, that were pre COVID. I mean, we'll see what, what happens after, you know, a couple months here. I, I hope things, um, I hope people are willing to break that six foot barrier and, and be able to bump shoulders with people. One, one, one last analogy. I know we're kind of cutting on time, but uh, one thing I, I, I think it was like a bar rescue episode or something like that. I was watching where they literally talked about like, Bars were set up a certain way so that you had these bump areas where like people would 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 mingle with each other. If it was too wide open, people wouldn't feel like they're a part of a community. And it's kind of like I, I wish there were more bump areas in life where we could just meet each other. And like I said, we I, we might have said two or three words to each other at this old company before. But I always respected you. It sounds like you you know respected me. So from that perspective, it's like we need more interaction with people, and that's one of the reasons why I felt you know kind of de depressed at that point last year. So I think from that perspective, it's like, you have to be willing to put yourself out there and just say, Hey, I'm going to be vulnerable. I'm not going to take myself too seriously. I'm going to, to bump in with other people and we'll see what happens. Uh, you know, if it, it, it's being comfortable in the uncomfortable, those are uncomfortable situations and uh, I, I thrive for it. So I really hope that this norm, new normal includes more bump areas. I love it. I that's literally that was a perfect conclusion to the episode. Uh, a great way of tying it all back together. It really is. Guys, be willing to be uncomfortable. It's scary at first. But once you try it, it changes everything. I mean, I will end this with an analogy where I think about like, I became very good at hosting parties and social gatherings because of my parents. They always had to host stuff because of in diplomats have to host other diplomats like so the Mexican ambassador would have the American ambassador over the president of that country. And like, you know, we're hosting like 30, 40 people. You know, my mom is either catering or making food herself and we have music. And all of a sudden my dad is like having karaoke going so that people can like mingle together with a shared activity. Like you said, a bump thing. And that's kind of where I you know, tying it back to my Mexican tradition, I had like this thing, like I called it the Mexican cheers where like I do a shot with people or I gather people together and like, do you guys know the Mexican cheers? And like everyone starts doing it. And there's a lot of strangers that come together. Like I asked them, Hey, come on, do a shot with me. I'm going to teach you the Mexican cheers. And if you ever go to Mexico, you can get a free shot if you do this because Mexicans love Americans who appreciate their culture. So all of a sudden you have like 10, 15, 20 people that have never talked to each other. Maybe they all know me, but now they're doing the shot together. We do it like everyone's like yelling because, you know, they're excited. It's something different. And now all those 10, 20 people feel like they can talk to each other because now they have a shared activity. They're like, man, what did you think about that? Mexican cheers. Oh, that was crazy, huh? Now they feel like they can actually just approach the stranger because before it's like, hey, I don't want to interrupt them. But now they're able to do that. They did something that maybe made them uncomfortable, but now they feel comfortable and now it completely changed the dynamic of the gathering, the party. It's just little things like that. And it, it really resonated with me what you said about, hey, like those areas for people to bump into. And it's kind of crazy how it's just kind of completely vanished right now with COVID. But I know we're going back to that. And I'm super excited to see that. But I appreciate you so much for everything you said, all the messages and advice that you had to offer. I think there's a lot of great things that people can absorb there. I mean... We've had uh, some similar experiences, but also completely different ones. So guys, make sure you listen to everything Michael has to say. He will not lead you astray, but you know, also remember to forge your own path. So now is your opportunity to make any shout outs you want to do, talk about anything that you want to share or you know, thank people that you want to thank. So the floor is yours. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And if you want to connect on me, you can find me at, on LinkedIn, uh, Michael Dudley, D-U-D-L-E-Y. Um, I'm also launching a YouTube channel where I'm talking about some of the patient success stories that we're doing. It's just trying to keep things positive. And you know, I think in today's world, um, we have people uh, constantly bashing each other on social media, just a just an array of positivity. So I'll be doing a lot more to bring you guys in on that future journey on LinkedIn, as well as on YouTube, you can find me at value based Michael on YouTube. Again, we're just getting started. Uh, I'm pretty excited, but I'm going to be building this brand. And if you are, if you're in the healthcare space, and you have a provider, if you are working with a practice who uh, wants to be able to impact lives, I'd love to talk with you more. Again, you can reach me at uh, Michael dot Dudley at cohort dot AI that's C O H O R T dot AI. That is the email address. Uh, you can feel free to shoot me an email too. 
I mean, ultimately, um, I love meeting new people. So don't don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, I, I just love hearing experiences. I mean, I, I, I'm always attracted to people that come from different backgrounds than me. So to hear like the, the karaoke and uh, karaoke is one of those things I'm not good at. Uh, that's one of the secret moments I was telling you about. I mean, hearing the, that culture aspect of it, I, I love that. I love that part. I love learning about that. So um, it actually kind of drew up one last point, which is um, be inquisitive and ask questions. I think at that point in time, if you, if you ask somebody like, Oh, what was that like? I think people are just naturally going to, or, you know, if you ask for help or ask questions, you're like, Oh my gosh, you just seem curious. People will put you under their wing and they'll carry you along for their ride. Or so, um, I mean, I just, I just can't thank you enough for, for hosting this specific podcast and everything that you're doing. Uh, I love the brand. I love what you guys are encouraging people to do. So I would just, uh, thank you guys for, um, for having me and doing what you guys are doing. Uh, and I just, I personally just thank you for having me. Um, ultimately, if, if I get nothing other than just, you know, one person saying that the, their life, you know, they did one or two, two changes where they, uh, they just took off their headphones in the airplane, one or two things. I am so happy that I spent this time with you. Yeah. Well, I view this as I'm definitely going to stay in touch with you. I'm going to be following your journey. I love that it can start new friendships, new connections. I mean, I think it's so cool, especially, uh, you know, people that are willing to risk to try something new and build something new. I'm like, I, I've never done YouTube before and all this stuff like that. I'm sure you haven't really either. So it's so cool to see other people also trying to expand their horizons and build personal brand and professional brand as well. I will always support that. And I know a lot of people are going to resonate with this. You had some excellent things to share. I guess I have one last question to you. So I've interviewed some people that don't have a lot of experience that are still very young because I want to prove to people that so many people feel like they don't have anything to share. They don't have any advice. They don't have any wisdom. And I tell them that's not the case at all. Like someone could, you could be 22, 23, and you've lived a crazy life or you've figured out something that maybe none of us have realized. Yet here you are, you've worked at some very prestigious companies. You've gone through amazing things. You've had some lows, but you've overcome it. And now you're trying a new journey. And I think there's so much to be said about that. So uh, what do you feel about, I guess, to, to send us off for social wisdom, what is your take on wisdom? Is that something that is age related, experience related, or does everyone have something to share? While you were saying that, I I, I instantly became very opinionated. I, I, I'm glad you asked that question. So I, I appreciate your willingness to just kind of feel the vibe. So as a manager, uh, I everyone who had I managed up until I think six months before everything changed with COVID, everyone who I was managing was older than me. So I was managing people who like in an age perspective was older than me. However, uh, I think that my experience with the organization and, and my drive was the reason I was in that role and they weren't. Yeah, I don't think there were any subordination issues because of it. But the one person I hired that was younger than me, um, I had to make a decision. I had one one sales rep candidate that had done an interview and he was a young guy. He actually didn't speak great English, but he had a drive to him and he had a pure like positivity that you couldn't deny. And I had two or three other candidates that were really, really well established uh, that had, you know, accolades had been top rep and, and had done everything. But um, they were also they felt like they were more uh, closed minded and that they were going to do things their way. I ended up hiring the younger guy because he had that drive. He had that tenacity. Uh, he had like a, a, um, a positivity that I knew that I was going to enjoy managing him. And he genuinely cared about what was going on. I, um, and in fact, uh, he's one, one of my favorite hires because he was so genuine and he had, he had an energy that you don't see very often. So I, you know, I, I hope that I can be like that type of energy. And I, I think you definitely are when we run across these type of human beings that just are, are positivity. That's why when you were, you were asking me like, how, what's the difficulties of COVID? I was like, I want to talk about the positivity first. I don't want to be known as that guy who's complaining. I never want to come in and, and, uh, describe a problem without coming with a solution. I never, I always want to be that positive guy, even if the world isn't around as positive. I, I'm going to be transparent. I'm going to tell it like it is. But at the same point, at the end of the day, I want to be someone that people want to be around. And I think that as my last, last, last uh, soapbox moment is just to be a positive person that people want to be around. And if that's the case, you can be successful at sales. You can be successful at anything you do. Thanks so much, Michael. Well, you guys heard it here. Get uncomfortable with the comfortable and you'll become a rising phoenix. Hey, my fellow challengers. 
Thanks so much for experiencing the social wisdom of the week. We hope you absorbed as much as you could. Please leave a comment if you learned something or if you have another guest whose wisdom you'd love to hear. If the message is helping you, please remember to check out our coffee donation page so we can also become exceptional. Follow our journey on all our social medias and subscribe so you will never miss an opportunity to hashtag be a sponge. Chaminger 